the historical roots of the rapidly expanding cult of Mary with the worship of ancient goddesses and other pagan practices have been examined in an earlier chapter. Such links now seem to strengthen what we assumed before, or even proved before. The New Age movement is undoubtedly advancing on many fronts, not least in the Church, which will not endure sound doctrine, having itching ears. Many Christians have drunk deep drafts of New Age potions. For example, holistic health, hypnosis, yoga, inner healing, meditation, psychical research and awareness training, and many have imbibed new doctrines and heresies based on the humanistic and positive thinking of Taylor de Chardin, Norman Vincent Peale and others which provide the church with its emphasis on an earthly kingdom now, the social gospel and society reconstructed for Christianized with kingdom principles for the Lord's return. Restorationist leader Bryn Jones, writing in the beginning of 1991, promised his followers that, quote, by the power of his spirit, we will bring all that is against God and man beneath Christ's authority. God's church will be the most influential body of people on earth in the final period of this age. Unquote. This is indeed a prophetic word, but it is fulfilled in scripture only by the apostate church of the book of Revelation. Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Juggler 66, Hour of the Truth. This one's called The Papacy and Political Power. It deals with Chapter 6 of the book All Roads Lead to Rome by Michael de Semlian. And before I even begin, I have to tell you that when you think that we are studying in depth the papacy and political power in this subject, in this chapter of the book, I thought so before I read it. And I have to tell you, pity enough, um, he doesn't go as deep as could go into the subject. But on the other hand, this is only one, <coughs> one of all the chapters in this book. I mean, uh, it has in total 21 chapters. So on this subject, the papacy and political power, you can write your own book, of course. And... Um, if you really want to dig more into that and know more about this, then I advise you to go to Tom Fress's reading that he did on Inquisition Update <coughs> on the books, uh, first of all, The Global Vatican by former ambassador to the Holy See, Francis Rooney, and uh, second of all to his reading of James Atkin Wiley's wonderful book, Rome and Civil Liberty. And you can find that, of course, in the archives of First Amendment Radio or on the YouTube channel of First Amendment Radio. And uh, if I think about it, I will, of course, also put the links in the description box of this video. But otherwise, you can always comment on that and I will provide the links if you aren't able to find them. But uh, still, Michael de Semlian goes on here with this book now in Chapter 6, The Papacy and Political Power. And we are reading some interesting stuff among... Uh, things about the P2 Lodge, uh, Propaganda Due, as it is called, Lucio uh, Jelly, who was long time the Grand Master of that Lodge, and uh, a little bit about the um, bank scandal uh, the Vatican was involved in in the 80s. And um, it's, it's quite interesting to read the sub uh, this, this subject, this chapter. But it doesn't go as deep as I would have liked into the real commitment of the papacy and political power. But before I criticize on and on and on, I will rather start reading. The papacy and political power. Undoubtedly, the profile of the papacy is now rapidly rising. The public relations progress made by Roman Catholicism over the last few years has been remarkable.
The post-war reputation of the Vatican lay in ruins as a result of Antichrist Pius XI's concordance with Hitler, Mussolini and Franco, and Antichrist Pius XII's apparent sympathy with the fascist cause and indifference to the plight of the Jews. An article in the London Evening Standard of 18th of April 1989 by Irish Catholic statesman Conor Cruz O'Brien argued that Antichrist Pope Pius XI's earlier attempt to bring relief to the Jews was thwarted by his sudden death and by the subsequent opposition to the proposed measures of both his successors, Pope Pius XII and Jesuit General Ledokowski. Now, this article in the Evening Standard is exceptional. Many feature articles have appeared during the last three years in the quality newspapers and supplements rehabilitating the reputation of Antichrist Pope Pius XII. The rebuilding of this Pope's reputation is most important for Catholicism, as the Fatima cult has been greatly enhanced by his unique personal vision of 1950 regarded by millions of the faithful as a special miracle of an extra holy being. It was Pius XII also who declared and defined the doctrine of the Assumption of Mary in 1950, confirmed by his own mystical experience. And when we are reading here that undoubtedly the profile of the papacy is now rapidly rising, well, think of that in the day of today, 2016, right? <clears throat> but the author continues on the bottom of page 70, if you're going to read along in your own copy of the book. Yet today the aura of media acclaim around the person of the Pope is quite remarkable and might even exceed that enjoyed by another Roman Catholic hero, first Catholic President of the United States of America, John F. Kennedy, who came to power almost devoid of real policies and for much of the duration of his presidency enjoyed a unique prolonged honeymoon with the media. Well, I just have to go a very little side note on John F. Kennedy here. He was a Roman Catholic president, that's true. But to become the first Roman Catholic president of the United States of America, in 1961 before he was elected, he went from Washington to Texas to assure different Protestant denominations and church leaders, Protestant church leaders, um, to make sure to them that he would not follow the Pope, but he, that he would be um, a little bit, let's say, independent, <laughs> maybe like that. Maybe that's one of the reasons why they killed him, because he broke away from Catholicism during his reign, because then when he entered the White House, he all of a sudden realized that the White House already was run by Roman Catholics, and he could not do very much about it. And when he started doing things about it, yeah, okay, that's when they afterwards killed him. Now, the f interesting thing about this, Kennedy went from Washington to Texas to assure Protestants that he would not put the Pope as his first authority, and therefore gaining the support of Protestants in the United States of America to his election. And a few years later, some 30 years something, George W. Bush did exactly the same, and came from out of Texas, where his home is, to Washington, to assure the Roman Catholics over there that he would follow the Pope. So that's quite interesting to know, these two different approaches of the so-called presidents. Kennedy, a Catholic, assuring Protestants he will not put the, po put the Pope in front, and George W. Bush, allegedly being a Protestant, doing exactly the opposite. <laughs> I thought that is a little interesting quote to know. But the author continues now, like John XXIII, John Paul II has demythologized and humanized the papacy and his media performance has done much to remove suspicion and fear as well as unhappy memories. His background as an actor has been helpful in a world conditioned by images. His audience is not always able to distinguish real life from soap opera and has largely relegated history to the status of the latter rather than the former. 
The fact, in fact, the present Pope's image and reputation appear unassailable. Vatican scandals involving large-scale fraud and corrupting and complicity and cover-up have simply been shrugged off. Archbishop Marcinkus, who was at the center of it all, was protected by the Pope for more than seven years, and the Italian state authorities somehow rendered helpless. According to the Times in an article on 19th of July 1987, quote, In a surprise and almost unprecedented move, the Italian Supreme Court cancelled arrest warrants issued against Marcinkus and two other senior Vatican bankers, unquote. Roman Catholic Oxford professor of logic Michael Dummett accused the Pope of complicity in a cover-up to protect Marcinkus. The Sunday Telegraph on the 15th of March 1987, reporting from the Catholic weekly The Tablet, said that Professor Dummett spoke of, quote, the Vatican Bank entangled with complicated practices from which the most pungent stink of corruption arises. These practices involved other banks and mafia at the seemiest type of Freemasonry, culminating in what, uh, in what was possibly the bizarre suicide, but more probably the grotesque murder of an Italian banker in London. Unquote. The Catholic Herald reported that it had been revealed that Roberto Calvi was in London to seek help from Opus Dei. It is interesting that it has taken an Italian court ruling to judge Calvi's death as murder. Two inquests in London had previously determined an open verdict. The Italian judgment is a confirmation of the position adopted by Professor Dummett and also of Stephen Knight, who in his book, The Brotherhood, argued that the death was inextricably bound up with the riddle of P2, Propaganda Due and Freemasonry's penetration not only of the Roman Catholic Church, but of the Vatican itself." Unquote. The Milan verdict has brought blunt accusations <coughs> of complicity in Calvi's murder leveled at Marcinkus by Calvi's widow, who claims that her husband had told her shortly before his death, the priests want me dead. Marcinkus resigned as head of the Vatican Bank but remained under the Pope's protection and enjoyed Vatican immunity. Attempts by the Italian authorities to put him on trial with the others accused of fraud were brushed aside by the Vatican. The Pope simply refused to hand him over. The Banco Ambrosiano fraud trial, seven years in the making and likely to last for one or two more at the time of the writing of this book, is taking place as, as this book is written. Now I will um, provide you with the link from Wikipedia and with a link from rens.com that you can read more about the Banco Ambrosio, Ambrosiano fraud trial and get more information on that. I will not go into this during the reading of this book. But it is quite interesting to study that a little bit. According to the Sunday Observer, the author continues, it is hoped that the trial will throw light on, a how, on how a staggering 800 million pounds vanished, leading to the worst bank, uh, to the worst bank crash in post-war Europe. Quote, how deeply was the Holy See and its Polish Pope involved, and why? State investigators now believe that nearly £100 million was smuggled into Warsaw to help the solidarity struggle, and this is certain to be raised at the trial." Unquote. The article by William Scobie goes on to say that sources in the Vatican point out that they have a ready answer. If the pontiff did support Valencia in, his, in this way, quote, it has been the tripwire for the freedom of all Eastern Europe. Unquote. You can read that in the Observer, Sunday, 3rd of June, 1990. And the author comes to the conclusion, the end will have justified the means. That is the motto of the Jesuit order. The end always justifies the means. <clears throat> Whatever you do, when you do it for the quote-unquote good of the church, then you can do whatever you need to do to achieve that goal. The end justifies the means. It seems likely that, apart from the transfer of funds to aid Solidarity and other Vatican ventures such as in El Salvador or Nicaragua, also emerging will be the Vatican Bank's close dealing with the Mafia, 
cantering around the colorful former drug racketeer Michel Sindona, close friend of Pope Paul VI and with P2 Masonic Lodge Grand Master Lucio Gelli. The P2 Lodge connection is deeply embarrassing to the Roman Catholic Church. The influential P2, meaning Propaganda Dewey, regarded by mainstream Freemasonry as something of a renegade, was expelled from Italian Masonry three years before the scandal broke. How was it then that the Vatican was so deeply involved with it? Disclosures could also be made emerging out of the Vatican's involvement with P2 and Banco Ambrosiano, that funds were transferred through a Vatican-owned company called Bellatrix to provide the means of supply of Exocet missiles to Argentina. To avoid such disclosures, Vatican watchman Irishman Philip Power has suggested the papacy would have seen would have seen the need for reconciliation or accommodation with Freemasonry. We can read that in Irish Christian Assemblies, Limerick in Ireland. The papacy would have seen the need for reconciliation or accommodation with Freemasonry. Yeah, we know that Freemasonry on the top is controlled by the Jesuit order, by the Black Pope, right? Just before the press revelations relating to the P2 Lodge of Italian Freemasonry and the Vatican Ambrosiano Bank scandal, the papal ban on Freemasonry was suddenly lifted in January 1983. How come, huh? Because they're working for the same goal. According to the widely acclaimed evidence gathered by author Philip David Yellop, the involvement of leading members of the Roman Curia and secret societies, including P2 and other Masonic lodges, was revealed to Pope John Paul I by the Italian news agency L'Osservatore Politico, shortly before his untimely and mysterious death in September 1978. You know, John Paul I reigned only for 33 days. Interesting number. And the circumstances of his death can only lead to the conclusion that he was poisoned. Now, the quote comes here. Luciani, means John Paul I, held the view that it was unthinkable for a priest to become a member of a Masonic Lodge. The Great Vatican Lodge list that the Pope was given contained the names of 121 confirmed members of Freemasonry to which the Roman Catholic Church had long declared itself implacably opposed. Unquote. We can read that in Yellop's work in God's Name on pages 255 and 256. Roman Catholic writer Piers Compton in his book the Broken Cross, recounts in considerable detail the initiation of Angelo Roncalli, later Pope John XXIII, into the Society of Rosecroix or Rosicrucians, in 1935. He also lists 11 cardinals, including Casseroli, Sunens, the Belgian we spoke about earlier, and Villet, and 75 other senior prelates of the Church, archbishops, bishops, Monsignors and Papal Nuncios, together with their code names and dates of initiation as members of secret societies. Masonry encourages all religions. The great architect of the universe, it is argued, can be approached through many mediators, including Buddha, Muhammad, Krishna, or through Jesus Christ. Churches that accept Freemasonry offer little or no resistance to ecumenical unity, and thus Freemasonry and Catholicism, freed from the difficulties of the past, can share a common goal in overseeing one world faith. Yeah, because all the faiths that I've just mentioned, the faith in Buddha, Muhammad or Krishna, is easy to put them all together because they all have, as you know, the same source. They all derive from Babylon. And so, Freemasonry working together with Catholicism behind the scenes, of course, because Freemasonry is nothing else but the Protestant arm of the military Jesuit order. So they have 
Catholicism on the one hand and Freemasonry on the other. And whether you are in a secret society bound to the Roman Catholic Church, like papal knighthoods and things like that, or you are in Freemasonry and other secret societies combined with that. But in the end you are controlled by the same person in whatever secret society you are in. And that means because the controller is the same, they share a common goal in overseeing one world faith. You can also call it one world religion. All the secret societies are working for that one world religion. Now the next part of this chapter is called Influence and Authority of the Papacy. Yet the Pope's moral authority continues to grow and he is recognized as a great leader. The influence he exercises in the world today is unrivaled since pre-Reformation times. <laughs> Surely that is the case today in 2016. A typical example of this is from a 1986 article in Time magazine about a Zulu chief Butelisi. Quote, his prestige is such that he has conferred with Pope John Paul II, President Reagan, Prime Minister Thatcher and other world leaders. Unquote. During the hostage crisis in the Lebanon in August 1989, the Times reported that following the execution of American Colonel Higgins, President Bush consulted the Pope and other world leaders on the telephone. In November 1990, when President Gorbachev took the road to Rome, as the Daily Telegraph put it, there was no more mockery of the size of the Pope's divisions, no more talk about the opium of the people. Instead, a visit by the Pope to the Soviet Union would bring a great prestige to the beleaguered president. Unquote. You can read that in the Daily Telegraph, 19th of November, 1990. Mr. Gorbachev was accompanied by 24 officials for that visit, a more powerful delegation than that accompanying him to the official visit to Italy. The Vatican has enormous diplomatic clout and maintains one of the largest diplomatic representations of any country. Diplomatic relations with Britain and the United States have only very recently been established, in 1982 and 1984 respectively. The first two U.S. ambassadors to the Vatican, William Wilson and Frank Shakespeare, were both members of the Secret Knights of Malta, an organization which itself has diplomatic relations with no fewer than 42 nations. This is taken from Concerned Christians, Catholics and Charismatics in Denver, Colorado. And I just have to add here, the first U.S. ambassador to the Holy See, the mentioned here, William Wilson, was the first since the re-establishment after diplomatic relations with the Vatican have been broken off after the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. Because at that time, Americans knew that the Roman Catholic Church was behind the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. And they broke all contact, diplomatic contact to the Vatican. And interesting, of course, is also that you read here that William Wilson and Frank Shakespeare were both members of the Knights of Malta. So was Francis Rooney, the author of the book The Global Vatican, that I mentioned in the beginning. No other church has ever seen the necessity for any involvement in such temporal activity as the Vatican. This uneasy mixture of confessional box and diplomatic bag has always posed problems for the national security of all countries. It has undoubtedly contributed to the problems in Nicaragua, El Salvador and particularly in Ireland. Yet the world statesmen and rulers continued to seek audiences to consult the Pope on global strategy. George Schultz, America's Secretary of State and like many, other, like many members of the Reagan administration, a Roman Catholic, consulted the Pope before major discussions, stopping off at the Vatican on the way to Middle East peace conferences. Yasser Arafat, 
after the American acceptance of the December 1988 PLO peace initiative at the United Nations also stopped at the Vatican on 24th of December 1988, presumably for more than a Christmas blessing. Arafat has met with the Pope more than once, two men with apparently very little in common. <laughs> yeah. But what people do not know is that Yasser Arafat is working for the Pope, like all political leaders in the world today. It was significant that the 70-year breach of relations between the Kremlin and the Vatican was ended in December 1989 by then-President Gorbachev's going to the Vatican. It was Gorbachev's first call en route to his summit with President Bush. The Protestant Alliance uh, Alliance's reformer magazine sounded a warning. Quote, it is not without significance that Mikhail Gorbachev went to see the Pope in this time of crisis. This stirs fears in many hearts. The reunion of Germany under a Vatican-dominated party gives cause for concern. Will history be repeated? Will there be a pro-Vatican bloc in Europe again, this time allied to a friendly Russia, with Poland, Hungary, Romania and Czechoslovakia in tow? Will this be a repeat on a wider scale of the Vatican support of the Central Powers leading up to the First World War and the Fascist Powers in the Second World War? These are pertinent questions. The Vatican has never lost its objective of world dominion. Unquote. Very important last sentence. These are pertinent questions. The Vatican has never lost its objective of world dominion. The Church to rule the world, the Pope to rule the Church, and the Jesuits to rule the Pope. Poland and the Papacy. The Sunday Express banner headline on 6th of November 1988, quote, Maggie sought Pope's blessing, unquote, revealed that Mrs. Thatcher took the extraordinary step of consulting the Pope on the eve of her spectacular visit to Poland. At Blotch in Poland in 1987, the Pope illustrated the Vatican's new cloud in the communist world, when he told a huge assembly of workers at an open-air mass that they had the right to be represented by free trade unions. Lech Walesa, newly elected president of Poland and Nobel Prize, a Nobel Peace Prize winner, described by the press as a fervent Catholic, seems to have led a charmed life all through the heady days of the launch and struggle of solidarity. He thrived while the trade union grew during the communist years, moving freely around the world with his meteoric career culminating in his election as head of state in December 1990. His closeness to all things Catholic is apparent for everyone to see. The Evening Standard, in an editorial on 29th of November 1989, described Valanza as, quote, a man of enormous power in Poland. He is not a politician. He is not a soldier. Not exactly a trade unionist. He is a Catholic first, a Polish nationalist second. And if he is a socialist at all, it is only in that he is not an avowed capitalist, unquote. He is regularly photographed with crucifixes or with images of the Virgin Mary or making the signs of the cross on television. Also with cardinals and, and priests who previously acted as mediators with the communist government. The Associated Press reported on the 11th of December 1990 that Valenza publicly swore allegiance to the Black Madonna of Jasna Gora, also known as Our Lady of Czechoslovakia. His close relationship with the Church of Rome may well explain the freedom that Lech Walesa enjoyed in the early years of solidarity, as well as indicate the extent of the influence exercised for many years by the Vatican over the communist regime. Now I just have to go back 
uh, one sentence again about the Associated Press reported on the 11th of December that Valenza, uh, that Valenza publicly swore allegiance to the Black Madonna of Jasna Gora, also known as Our Lady of Czechoslovakia. Czechoslovakia. Yeah. Malachi Martin, in his book The Keys of This Blood, emphasizes that uh, the Pope's devotion to the Black Virgin of Jasna Gora. Martin claims that John Paul believes the Virgin of Jasnagora was the chief reason that he was elected pontiff. Dr. Martin also describes how, when the Pope met Mikhail Gorbachev on 1st of December 1989, quote, at 11.03 a.m., he ushered Gorbachev into the library, motions him, in, motions him into a chair, sits down opposite him, opens his notes and starts talking. A reproduction of Poland's national treasure, the icon of Czechoslovakia, meaning the Black Virgin of Jasna Gora, bearing the slash mark of a Tatar saber on the cheek, has been placed on an easel on, to the right of the both leaders and some few feet of the table at which they sit. Unquote. Interesting, right? To meet right under the eyes of the quote-unquote Queen of Heaven. Now, his close relationship with the Church of Rome may well explain the freedom that Lech Valencia enjoyed in the early years of Solidarity, as well as indicate the extent of the influence exercised for many years by the Vatican over the communist regime. This freedom, reminiscent of, remark of the remarkable liberty that John Paul II himself had enjoyed as Cardinal Wojtyla before he became Pope. It was very apparent at that time that the same freedom was not extended to the primate of that time, Cardinal Wojcinski. The French publication Didasco expressed its skepticism soon after John Paul II's 1978 election. Quote, no one capable of coherent thought will easily believe that a cardinal from behind the Iron Curtain can be anything but a communist plant. Unquote. If Didasco is right, then Wojtyla deserves to go down in his, as history's most successful double agent, having played the leading role in turning the tables on those who assured his election. The Roman Catholic Church's College of Cardinals has always been notorious for its intrigue. It may have outdone itself in the succession to John Paul I, whose untimely death occurred on the 28th of September 1978. In fact, Tadeusz Mazowiecki uh, was probably the Vatican's preferred choice for the presidency. As Poland's first non-communist prime minister, he had demonstrated the new political realities after taking office by going to the Vatican rather than to Moscow. As a leader of solidarity, he helped Valenza and others successfully to invest the Vatican's near 100 million pounds in providing what Vatican sources have described to reporters of the Banco Ambrosiano fraud trial as, quote, the trip wire for the freedom of Europe, unquote. The less colorful Mazowiecki, another old friend of Pope John Paul and former editor of a leading Catholic, Catholic journal, was probably seen by Rome as likely to prove more reliable than Valencia in the top job. The new electorate did not agree. In the presidential election, after it was clear that Mazowiecki was out of the running, it was reported that the Roman Catholic Church belatedly announced its support for Valenza, and Primate Cardinal Glemp cast his very influential vote for him in order to point the way to preventing the possibility of a surprise Timinsky victory. Nevertheless, Lech Valenza knows how much he owes to the Vatican and to the Pope. In February 1991, the new Polish President Valenza returned to the Vatican for his third visit there. The Roman Catholic universe reported that, brimming with the self-confidence, he swept in to tell the Pope, quote, I offer you our new Poland, unquote. You can read that in the universe from the 10th of February 1991. 
And this reminds me of a little video I made from Tom Fress, where he cites that in the meeting that Ronald Reagan had with the same Pope, he went down on his he allegedly went down on his knees and said, "Holy Father, I give you my country." <laughs> Watch that video; it's in my playlist of Inquisition update. You don't want to miss that. And uh, well, it's very much the same as we see here that when Lecvalenza goes back to the Pope and says, "Well, I offer you, you, I offer you our new Poland." <laughs> The new freedom experienced in Poland may not last long. There is already considerable widespread concern about the mixing of church and state. In an article headed, Worries over a resurgence of Poli po Polish Catholicism, Newsweek magazine uh, signaled the danger. Quote, the resumption of religious education in Poland's public schools is only one sign of the growing power of the Church in a country that is more than 90% Roman Catholic. After years of wrestling with a hostile regime, the Church has been embraced by Poland's new rulers, blurring the boundaries between Church and State. Prime Minister Tadeusz Malodwicki and Solidarity Leader Lech Walesa regularly appear at Church Darity Leader Lech Walesa, uh, sorry, I, I missed the line here. I'm going to start the sentence again. Prime Minister Tadeusz Mazowiecki and Solidarity Leader Lech Walesa regularly appear at church ceremonies, religious programs and featured on state television. Soldiers march in a pilgrimage to the Shrine of the Black Madonna. And an anti-abortion legislation dominates parliamentary deliberations. All this has prompted some Poles to wonder whether the Church is not overplaying its hand. The decision on religious instructions has already prompted angry exchanges. Critics charge that pupils will feel pressure to enroll and that few schools provide alternative activities for those who opt not to. This is going from one swarm from one form of indoctrination to another, says Ivona Osuk, who, whose 14-year-old son sits out in the corridor while the rest of his class has religious instruction. Cardinal Joseph Glemp, the Polish primate, has blamed the scattered protests of a, quote, very noisy minority, unquote, on the legacy of the communist system, which encouraged, quote, unquote, an aversion to God. And we can... Read this in the Newsweek from the 15th of October, 1990. This is going from one form of indoctrination to another, says the mother whose 14-year-old son sits out in the corridor while the rest of his class follows religious instruction. Yes, first you have the brainwashing indoctrination of communism and atheism, and now you have the brainwashing indoctrination of Roman Catholicism. And more than 90% of Polish people are Roman Catholic. Well, in May 1991, just seven months after the Newsweek feature, another article called More Power to the Pulpit appeared in rival magazine Time, confirming the swift trend towards the Church's dom dominance in Poland. An excerpt is quoted here. Quote, when the struggle ended with a solidarity-led government, the church, in, uh, the church emerged triumphant, firmly allied to an administration it had all but installed. A year later, the church, to which 97% of Poland's 39, 38 million people belong, is omnipresent and, in the view of some, virtually omnipotent. Bishops and priests bless the armed forces, schools and factories. The newly created post of senior chaplain to the army has been given the rank of general. The nightly news on state-owned television unfailingly includes a church-related piece of one kind or another.
On Constitution Day earlier this month, marking the 200th anniversary of Poland's first liberal constitution, President Lech Walesa, a devoted Catholic, skipped ceremonies at Parliament and instead visited the national shrine of the Black Madonna of Jasna Gora. A poll released last week shows that the Church is perceived as the single most powerful national institution, stronger than the government, the presidency, the military, the old communist nomenclatura, and even solidarity. The Church's ascendancy has left many polls uneasy, pondering the specter of a clerical state governed according to the dicta of Pope John Paul II, who will make his fourth visit to, this native, to his native Poland in June, unquote, from Time magazine, May 20, 1991. The fear that one form of intolerance has been succeeded by another was also expressed by English Protestant evangelist Roger Carswell in the September 1989 edition of Evangelicism Today. Quote, the believers in Poland have a great fear of solidarity feeling that it will bring restrictions on evangelistic work. One of the declared aims of solidarity is the outlawing of all religion other than Roman Catholicism. We must pray for Poland. Unquote. Now we deal with Czechoslovakia. Protestant leaders in Czechoslovakia expressed similar concerns, believing that the Roman Church had been controlling and manipulating the political situation there, just as in Poland. In April 1990, Czechoslovakia became the first Warsaw Pact country visited by the Pope outside his native Poland. Just a few months before, Cardinal Tomasek, the country's Roman Catholic primate had led 200,000 protesters calling for the end of communist rule. He ringingly denounced the Marxist regime and called for its rulers to be punished. punished. The observer suggested that the Pope's arrival had political significance as, quote, with elections only six weeks away and with Catholic political parties among the best organized of the 27 art in the running, the Pope's charisma will give some charge unfair promotion to the public image of the clerical campaigners. Unquote. Eugene Milo of the Slovak Reformed Church, Dr. Jaroslav Ondra of the Evangelical Church of Czech Brethren, and Eva Mikulex of the Hussite Church, on a visit to Britain in 1991, spoke of their concern about the ambitions of the Vatican. Quote, the Roman Catholic Church was very well prepared for the new situation with a comprehensive plan for the re-Christianization of Czechoslovakia. The aim is a quote-unquote Christian Republic, which means a Roman Catholic Republic. Catholic leaders are pushing hard to equate Catholicism with nationalism and have urged all Christians to support the pro-Catholic Christian Democratic Movement. The August 1990 edition of Christian News World reported, ah, oh, that was end of the quote, sorry. Yeah, end of the quote. And um, something interesting to see here, the aim is a Christian Republic, which means a Roman Catholic Republic. Catholic leaders are pushing hard to equate Catholicism with nationalism. Ha <laughs> ha! What have they done over there in the United States of America after the Second World War? If you were not a Catholic, you were supposed to be a communist, right? Remember the time of the harassment of people after the Second World War? Uh, what is that guy called? That McCarthy guy? If you were not a Roman Catholic, you were probably a communist. So that's why a lot of people became Catholics at that time in the United States of America. They're doing just the same game over here in, the, in at that time Czechoslovakia. Huh? It says so right here. These three people, Eugene Milo, Dr. Jaroslav Ondra, and Eva Mikulex of the Hussite Church, even state this. 
Ja? Nationalism, uh, to equate Catholicism with nationalism and have urged all Christians to support the pro-Catholic Christian democratic movement. The August 1990 edition of Christian News World reported that with the breakup of the communist trade unions, the Roman Catholic Church is the biggest organization in Czechoslovakia. Slovakia, which is 90% Roman Catholic, was an independent clerical pro-Nazi state during the Second World War and is once again experiencing strong nationalistic feeling within the Roman Catholic Church. Unquote, from the Christian's News World of August 1990. These nationalistic feelings have led swiftly to the, rep to the separation of the Slovak Republic from the Czech Republic, which took place on January 1st, 1993. And I want to end with a very small comment on one of the last sentences I read here. Really let that sink in and think about it what is really going on in this world. We read, The August 1990 edition of Christian News World reported that with the break-up of the communist trade unions, the Roman Catholic Church is the biggest organization in Czechoslovakia. Slovakia, which is 90% Roman Catholic, was an independent clerical pro-Nazi state during the Second World War, and is once again experiencing strong nationalistic feeling within the Roman Catholic Church. Unquote. Why is that so important to understand? Because nationalism, or another word for that is patriotism, brings you to Roman Catholicism. How or why should you or I as a Bible-believing, Jesus-following Christian, be patriotic to a country here in the kingdom of the Antichrist. Yeah, right. I pay my allegiance to one king and one king only, and his kingdom and his kingdom only, and that's Jesus Christ and his kingdom. We are here to see through the deception. We read this book to see through the deception the Roman Catholic Church throws at us. And by the Roman Catholic Church, in this case I mean Satan. Deception, lies, deceit, and of course they use things that at first sound positive, like patriotism. But then lure you into Roman Catholicism by exactly that. Okay, this was the end of chapter 6 in the book All Roads Lead to Rome by Michael de Semlian, and we will continue next time with chapter 7 called Towards Unity. Until then, Jogler 66 from Hour of the Truth signing off. God bless you and bye bye. We, as Bible-believing Christians, we know that the hand that is behind ISIS, the hand that is behind Al-Qaeda, is the same hand that is behind the United States of America government, that is behind the European Union government, and that is behind all the armies in the world, and that is behind all these um, mercenary companies out in the world, like XE, or formerly called Blackwater, run by Knights of Malta, etc., etc., so this is something that you really have to understand. This is all just a theater. And the point is, where is this theater going to lead to? When you are a Bible-believing Christian, you know that in the end times, Jesus warned us in Matthew 24, there will be wars, wars, and rumors of wars. And we know that the Antichrist, by peace, will destroy many, and so on, and so on, and so on. I could start citing the whole Bible up and down right now with citations like this to tell you what it's all about. But I don't have to sing to the choir or preach to the choir. 
you as Bible-believing Christians already know that. So the only thing that I ask of you is don't be caught in their game. Because when you are and you play their game, you have to play by their rules. And their rules are not Christ's rules. So the only thing that I can advise you of is, okay, take that information in what happens about there, pray for the people that these victims are being taken good care of, and that they are just deceived people, that they maybe have a chance by going through this situation, maybe they have a way to find to Christ in this way. Maybe they have a way to find to the real truth. I mean, these people are Muslims and coming from Muslim countries and coming to so-called, quote-unquote, Christian countries. Of course, the Roman Catholic Church is not Christian. Of course, the Protestant churches today don't preach any protest anymore. All right, I know that. But still, here and there, it is possible that a grain falls on the ground that can fall on fruitful ground, even with these refugees and the whole situation that is coming up. And that is the hope that we should have as Bible-believing Christians, and that is the prayer that we should use every day when we address our Lord to pray for our enemies as we pray for our friends. Because Jesus said, love your enemies and love your neighbor.